you that he's, been, he's now being moved onto a different territory. Before, it was all to do with the Lord and, and what he was doing with his people. But when you come to Jericho, it means you're moving onto the devil's territory. I mean, Jericho was a wicked place, and it was a very powerful place. You were told at college that um, uh, the walls were so thick, that means in width, that you, two chariots could pass on, on the top of the wall. And you think these walls would never come down. But God said they would. Now, before they uh, attacked Jericho, an interesting thing happened. And that was that Joshua met a Christophany. Christophany, sometimes called a theophany, is a pre-appearance of the Lord Jesus Christ in human form in the Old Testament. And there are several cases. You've got Jacob who, who was um, wrestling with the angel, or rather the angel was wrestling with him, is what it says. Um, and later on, thing, the way he talks about the angel and gives him the name of God, it was obviously God. Well, it wouldn't have been God the Father. It was God the Son in human form. And uh, when three men came to visit Abraham, we learn that two of them were angels, and one of them, in human form, was a man. And uh, it was before the Lord, this man in human form, that he interceded for, for Sodom. But that's another sermon altogether. Um, there's just there's so much in the, in the scripture that uh, I just love talking about. I hope you don't get tired of my voice. Um, so uh, there was this man, and uh, Joshua looked at him. What's he doing there? Are you a friend or are you an enemy? You're on the wrong note. I come as the captain of the Lord's host. Why? Because there is no way that Joshua could have caused those walls to fall down. It, it required his faith. We read in Hebrews, by faith the walls of Jericho fell. And it wasn't the faith of the walls. They didn't have faith. It was just... <laughs> Yeah, it was actually the faith of Joshua, but it was faith in the man that he'd met. And without that captain at the head of the army, there's no way that they would have defeated Jericho. It had to be Jesus um, to, to, to go as the captain. And I link uh, Jericho with, with um, a verse in... Uh, verse in... Um, in this, well, I, I tell you what the verse says. I know it so well. Uh, it says, the weapons of our warfare, it's chapter 10 of 2, is it 2 Corinthians? Mm -hmm. two, uh, 2 Corinthians, chapter 10, uh, round verses 4 to 6. Um, the weapons of our warfare are mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. And that's exactly what happened. And that's what we're meant to move on to. It's, it's lovely to, to meet on our Sundays and, and we're baptized, we're saved, we worship the Lord. But to move into the pulling down of strongholds. And, and uh, the weapons that we've been given are mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. Now, you probably wonder, well, how does that happen? And I'll tell you a story, true story. Um, <coughs> I was at Latchet Church. I was one of the elders there at the time, believe it or not. And uh, the leader there sent me to um, a week's Bible study by um, the Eccles Fellowship. I can't remember the, the name of the leader now. I know him so well. I've known him for years. Roger Forster. And he was going to lead this, this week's study. And I was to go every single day. And whilst I was there, he told us the story about Brent. He said that... The Ictus Fellowship got this very strong feeling from the Lord that he was leading them to, to plant a church in Brent. But try as they will, they couldn't. And they didn't know what, what, what the blockage was because they'd not experienced anything like this before. And uh, so they decided to spend prayer and fasting to find out why they couldn't plant a church. And the Lord revealed to one of the people in that prayer meeting, the problem in Brent is homosexuality. So then they spent a lot of time praying about that. And then they went to, to Brent. And guess what they preached about? What the Bible says about homosexuality. They didn't care what anybody. And they were absolutely slated in the press, in, uh, in, uh, in the radio, and in the television. Absolutely slated. 
but they just kept on. And in the end, the, the ministers in Brent got so fed up, they decided to call Roger Forster and have him over the coals. And so they called him and he quite happily went to them. And uh, they wanted an explanation. So he gave them a thorough Bible study on what uh, the Bible has to say about this, meaning this is what God says about this. And, um, and then when he finished, he still, they, they wanted to, to have him on the spot, but he, was, he decided he would put them on the spot. So what he did, he went around every minister and he asked them, are you a homosexual? Are you living with another man? And every single man in that place said no. He said, we'll see. That's all he said. And three days later, two boys let the cat out of the bag. Not only was the vicar a homosexual, he was living with a, a homosexual, and they had been farming out the boys in the church school to a whole ring of paedophiles. And of course, when this got out, it just rocked the whole thing, and the police were involved, and, and suddenly people began saying, what those people in Ixlus have been saying is worth being right all the time. And, well, do I need to tell you, after that they had no problem in planting a church in Brent. And I got, I heard that from Roger Forster himself. And that's the pulling down of strongholds. And uh, I've often heard about uh, centres of witchcraft, which are strongholds. And, and there are teams who actually focus on that to pull them down. Uh, that is part of our ministry, to pull down strongholds. But whether any of us are anywhere, anywhere near anything like that, but that's where we're meant to go on. But even that wasn't the end. Um, Elijah said, we're now going to Jordan. Uh, if I took one of my father's favorite sermons on Naaman, I would tell you that the River Jordan speaks of death. That was one of his, another favorite service, sermon of his was, was um, David's son, Absalom. But that's going back into the past. My father's long since gone to the glory. Um, um, it speaks of death. And um, all I want to say is something about George Muller. You all heard of George Muller and how the Lord used him to raise up for his orphanages two million pounds, which in today's money is 76 million pounds. And he never asked a penny from anyone. And someone went and asked him once, how do you do it? How is it other people would love to do this and can't? How is it that you can do it? And he answered this way. He said, there came a day when George Muller died. And uh, died to George Muller's ideas, his aims, his objectives, his likes and dislikes. And became totally alive to God only. And that was it. He... he he had died. He'd, he'd gone through this experience of, of death, and Paul knew this. He said, I die daily. And there's a lovely hymn that I could have had uh, on that, but I want to move on. Uh, Dying with Jesus by death reconciled. It's a lovely hymn, but um, other things fitted better this morning. Um, this need to die, and I'm preaching about something that I know very little about, but I have to preach it because I find it in God's Word. Please don't ever, ever think that because Brother Mervyn is preaching something, that he's arrived. It's not true, believe me. Um, I'm as big a sinner. I, I really struggle with, it, with, with some sin, and, and sometimes I get vengeful thoughts, and, you know, am I really a Christian, you know? But, but, the Lord has his grace, and, and, and by nature, that, the, the old nature keeps raising its ugly head. And uh, don't ever think that such things don't happen to Brother Mervyn just because there's a preacher. Don't you believe it? And we're just as sinful as anyone else. Um, I mean, we try not to sin. We plead for help and all that sort of thing, but it's still there. And, and it'll be there till our dying day. And then one day there will come a day when we'll never sin again. And I'm looking forward to that. So, uh, that concludes that. The next thing we come on to leads me on to the next sermon. And that is, where were they going? Uh, we've been told about uh, Gilgo and Bethel and, and Jericho and, and the Jordan. But uh, <coughs> after that, where are they going? <coughs> well, I'll tell you now, I'll let the cat out of the bag. 
but we'll come to it later on. I believe, and, and I'll tell you the reasons why I believe it, is that uh, where <coughs> Elijah was going, was he was going to the Pisgah, uh, Nebel area, um, where Moses died. Now, why should I think that uh, Elijah would want to do that? And it comes back to something that was called by um, C.S. Lewis in his book, seventh book of, of Narnia, The Last Battle. He, he, he repeats it again and again, and that is Shadowlands, how they went from the original Narnia into another place, and they found it, it was a place that was actually made the f former place of Shadowlands of the Narnia they're now in. And this happened two or three times in, in the story. Uh, re th stories repeating themselves, and that's one of the things that confer concerns scripture, because and what the pattern is, is Moses with Joshua, Elijah with Elisha, and John the Baptist who came in the spirit of Elijah with the Lord Jesus Christ. And um, Moses, Elijah, and John the Baptist were all forerunners. Now, can anybody tell me who were the last two men to be mentioned in the Old Testament in the book of Malachi? Can anybody tell me? Jesus. You've got it, haven't you? Come on. Jesus and John. No. In 3.1. Hmm? In Malachi 3.1. I prepare a way. They're not the last men to be mentioned. Ah. The last men to be mentioned in the book of Malachi are Moses and Elijah. And that shouldn't surprise us because they were forerunners and the Old Testament is the forerunner of the New Testament. Um, and it can go on. If you take who they were forerunning, in the case of Moses, it was Joshua. In the case of Elijah, it was Elisha. In the case of John, it was Jesus. Now you take the name Yahshua and Elisha and Yeshua, they're exactly the same name. They mean exactly the same thing. Um, this is, I, I think the Lord does this with these, these shadow lands in, in order to show us that it's, it's not just something comes up here from nowhere. It's all in the plan of God. The, this, these shadow lands are actually going on. So, um, now we've passed that bit, so we've come to the next bit. Um, we've passed the forerunners and the same names, and uh, now in the area where they died, Moses and Elijah appeared again, and uh, they appeared when Jesus appeared. So the coming of Jesus was linked with these two men on the Mount of Transfiguration. They were there, and uh, a voice came from heaven, this is my beloved son, hear him, because Peter had been intent on building tabernacles for Elijah and for Moses. God said, no, they're only forerunners. It's Jesus you should be looking at. And then suddenly, what happened to Moses and Elijah? He disappeared. And Jesus was there in all his glory, the glory that he was yet to have, but he, they saw him like that. Um, now, that's not the first time that God the Father spoke from heaven like that. Guess who was present the first time he shouted like that? Anybody know? John the Baptist. John the Baptist, that's right. Um, it, it's the, the, the shadow lines just appears and appears and, and appears. So, Oh, another thing I've got written down here is that um, uh, a, um, Joshua and Elisha, uh, we'll, we'll hold Jesus for a minute, Joshua and Elisha, they both passed through the River Jordan and they didn't get wet. The water didn't touch them. But when Jesus came to be baptized in the River Jordan, he was plunged into the depths. And uh, it, it was, the, the two, um, in, um, Joshua and Elisha, they never went into the depths of Jesus. Did. They were prefiguring him in a way, but it was only Jesus that went into the depths of the river of death. And of course, 
Calvary is, is right at the heart of it. You know, there was an occasion when Billy Graham said to Ruth, his wife, should I didn't preach very well tonight? And you're quite upset. She whispered to him, you never mentioned the cross. God forbid that I should glory, save in the cross of Christ my God. He left the cross home. But Jesus was plunged into the waters in his baptism. And, and of course, that's where we're baptized. We follow the Lord to the grave and, and, and raise in newness of life. I think I have a tangent, but the, the, the picture is there and, it, and, it, and it's beautiful. Now, uh, this brings us to look at, have another look at the sermon, not the Sermon on the Mount, the Mount of Transfiguration. Now, mostly people say, oh, that happened on Mount T Tabar in Galilee. Did it? It doesn't fit the description that's so clearly given in the Gospels. Mount Tabar is about half the height from, um, I can't remember the name of the place at the bottom of the, the hill from Stretley, um, Le, Le Clay, Barton Le Clay. Barton Le Clay up to Stretley, that's on the A6, where it's the beginning of, of the Chilterns. And about half the way up is about high, how high this, this, this pimple of a hill, Mount Tabor is. But the, the Bible says that where they went was to, to a high mountain apart. And, and Tabor's not apart, and it's not a high mountain. And yet they, they built a church on it and say that this is where Jesus was transfigured. And it says six days later. Why six days? Because that's how long it took to where they were going. And I believe they went to Mount Pisgah, where um, um, Elijah and, and Moses had died. Actually, it didn't, one of them didn't die. Well, at least he finished his life there. And um, that's where Jesus was, was actually taking his disciples. I believe, I'm convinced to it that that's where it must have been. Because it fits the pattern. These shadow lands just actually work. And, and, and that's where, where, where Jesus went with them. And um, <coughs> I'll have to stop and read my notes again. Um, And that's what the forerunner was about. Um, now, we, now, what we do now is, is I've, I've done that in summary form, the, the appearance of uh, Moses and Elijah um, up there, which I believe is, it was where the, the other two had died. Um, the next point I come to is to go back to the question, what was it that Elisha really wanted from Elijah? And Elijah put it to him, he says, now come on, what is it that you're after? What is it that you, you're, you're not content until you get it? And he said, I want a double portion of your spirit. Now, we have to be careful here because when he says your spirit, we could think of just talking about the spirit that's in a human being. Like the spirit of murder, there's nothing special about the spirit of murder. Sometimes he thinks things he shouldn't be thinking, all that sort of thing. Um, no, it, it wasn't the spirit of Elijah in that sense, his own personal spirit. It was the spirit that was upon him that caused him to work miracles. This, this is what he was really after, and he said, I want a double portion. Well, that's got two meanings. It can mean the, he wanted the birthright of Elijah because... The, the birthright always had the double portion. Other brothers had a single portion, but the birthright always had a double portion. <laughs> it can mean that. Another thing which my mother told me when I was young, and that was that Elisha worked twice the number of miracles that Elijah worked. So what did Brother Mervyn have to do? He had to go and count them. And he said, she's wrong. He said, there's, there's one missing. I didn't realize that my mother was cleverer than, cleverer than me, because in actual fact, there was one after Elisha died. And, and it, it turned to dust and only the bones were left. And a group were coming to bury a, a dead man. And they saw a war party coming. So they just dumped the, 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 the corpse into, into Elisha's grave and ran for it. And as soon as that corpse touched the bones of Elisha, he came back to life again. So it was dubbed exactly double the number. Um, so... I'm sorry, I've got to the point where my mind ten is tending to go blank, so I'm uh, switching to my notes, but you're listening so well. Um, 
Да, Бог. Oh yeah, um, I've got down here in Matthew 3, 4, I'm, I'm, I'm getting a bit lost now, uh, even reading my own notes. Um, okay, I'll, I'll leave that bit, bit about the Spirit because I, I, I can't even understand my own notes. Um, we'll move on to my last point, and that's the fact that Jesus is coming again. Now the question is, are there going to be forerunners? If he's coming again, are there going to be forerunners? What does the Bible say? There are. And guess who they're going to be? Well, let's, I've got, got the reference down here. Let's turn to Revelation 11.5 and see what happens before, just before Jesus comes again in the book of Revelation. I'm sorry about the bit I, I couldn't even make up what it was I, I'd written. Um, Still, you, you've been very tolerant, so I appreciate that. Um, so it's chapter 11, verses 5 and 6. Verses 5 and 6 in chapter 11. And, the, well, I'll start at verse 4. There are these two olive trees, the two lampstands which stand before the Lord of the earth. And if anyone would harm them, fire pours forth from their mouth and consumes their foe. Which prophet called down fire on his enemies? The only prophet in the, in the whole of the Bible. Who was it? Elijah. And uh, if anyone would harm them, um, he, he, he is doomed to be killed. And they have power to shut the sky so that no rain may fall during the days of their prophesying. Who was it? Elijah. It was Elijah when he did that. Now... If you go to the Old Testament, you will not discover that, it, that the, 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 the shutting of the sky actually lasted three and a half years. But Jesus knew. And when he was in his own, I think it was his own um, place of worship, what did they call it? Synagogue. That he, he said, to, um, he, he referred to the the woman in, in, in said when when the sky was shut for three and a half years that came from Jesus that's how we know and of course his brother learned it, his, his half brother learned it from him and that, and that was Jude and Jude also repeats it that it was three and a half years but three and a half years is also the period of the great tribulation and we're meant to understand that it lasts three and a half years because it's said in different ways in one place it says three and a half years, in another place it says 42 months, in another place it says time times in half a time, that's a year, two years and a half a year, and another time it says 1,260 days, which is three and a half lunar years. Um, so their prophesying actually lasted the whole of the Great Tribulation. Prior to Jesus coming at the end of the Great Tribulation, we know that from chapter 20, where it says this is the first resurrection. Well, the first resurrection after the resurrection of Christ is when the, the saints will be brought into, from their graves into their resurrection bodies. Um, so, um, now we've already seen two of the miracles, but it doesn't end with the two that um, uh, Elijah did. Let's read on. Um, they have power to shut the sky so that no rain may fall in the days of their prophesying, and they have power over waters to turn them to blood. Well, who did that? Moses. Of course it was Moses. And um, in case we, we miss that one about Moses, and to smite the earth with every plague as often as they desire. Well, it was what who brought plagues to Egypt. It was, now, I'm not saying that these are definitely Moses and Elijah. They could have come in the spirit of Moses and Elijah. It's just the fact that there will be these two forerunners who will be there before Jesus comes. And, and they will have a, an incredible ministry. But the thing is, I've looked at the, the whole picture of uh, <coughs> Shadowlands. Um, another one is Antiochus Epiphanes. You want Shadowlands. Both Josephus in the New Jewish War and the Maccabean uh, historical books, they both say that um, Antiochus Epiphanes ruled in Jerusalem, wait for it, for three and a half years. Can you not see Shadowlands there? And uh, he offered a pig on, on, on the temple altar. 
and the Jewish people referred to it as the abomination of desolation, shadowlands again. But um, let's not get hooked on, on shadowlands. The shadowlands, it, it's the shadow not only of what is past, but also of what is coming. And if there are forerunners, they're forerunners. It always looks forward to Jesus. That's why I chose these hymns this morning. Because our eyes have <coughs> just got to be filled with the Lord Jesus and, and him coming. And when uh, he was on the Mount of Transfiguration, he was, he was transfigured before them. They saw what he's going to be like when he comes. Uh, and it's going to be the same when he actually does come. But he's going to have his forerunners as well. At least that's the way I interpret the scripture, and believe me, I do not get everything right. So you, even the Apostle Paul said um, that, that was the, they, were, they, they searched the scriptures to see that everything he said was, was correct. So we say these wonderful things that, that really grip you, or at least grip me, um, but it, it doesn't mean to say that it's right just because Brother Mervyn says, I make mistakes. Believe me, I make, make mistakes. For years and years, I, I, I taught that if you go to a church uh, and um, then you go back after 60 years and you find that they haven't moved, they're still saying the same prayers, they're still saying the same choruses and the same hymns, they're still doing all that they were doing 60 years ago and, and they haven't moved. How do we know that they haven't moved? It was Elijah that told Elisha, said, stay where you are. You can stay there and still move with God. It doesn't follow just because they're doing the same same thing. And I've had to tell churches that I got that wrong. Uh, it's you, you don't have to you don't have to feel that because you're still where you were that um, God's not with you and God's not working. He will be working. He'll be doing wonderful things, and you'll be arranging coaches to take crowds up to hear Billy Graham in Harringay. But that's all past now. But it could be someone else that the Lord will send. We're certainly praying for someone. Why should Billy Graham be the last of the great evangelists? Um, God says, I do all things new. And uh, the thing I like about Elijah when he was going, all the prophets, not the prophets, the sons of the prophets, they were all saying, where is Elijah? And they go searching for him. For, but what was the question of Elijah, of Elisha when he came to the water? He didn't say, where, where's Elijah? Where is the God of Elisha? Well, this is what was on my heart to share you. I'm sorry about I, I, I do make mistakes, and they'll probably grow worse, and there may come a time when you can no longer have me. Um, I just couldn't figure out what it was I was actually saying there, for my own notes of all things. But anyway, um, what better song to finish with? Oh, it's here somewhere. Well, I, I know what it is. It's um, one of Graham Kendrick's songs, um, Shine.